first little part of our session tonight, I just want to talk about some basics when it comes to hybrid or blended learning. And because I'm an English teacher, I always start with uh, pre-teaching some key terms that you'll hear me use. And the first two I always like to mention are the difference between hybrid and blended because uh, I hear these terms used a lot and often they're used synonymously, which I think is okay, but I make a key distinction when I'm talking about these two key terms in that blended learning is going to refer to the type of tools you're using to teach. So a combination of traditional tools like books and paper and your whiteboard with technology, a blend of those two, whereas hybrid refers to place, this hybridization of having students in the school building some of the time and remote online uh, part of the time. We'll also be talking about synchronous and asynchronous. I think we all know these terms by now, but synchronous obviously is that teaching that is occurring live simultaneously. And that's regardless of if you're in person or online. Synchronous learning can happen either or as we know both ways versus asynchronous is that pre-built, pre-recorded lesson that students are going to be able to access um, at any point in a day or week or unit. And they're working through it at their own pace, deciding you know, how, how long to spend on it, when to work on it, and when to turn it in. The other basics I want to cover are um, instructional models when we're talking about hybrid learning specifically. The first type uh, I would consider alternating instruction, meaning your students are alternating engaging in a synchronous lesson and an asynchronous lesson, depending on which days they are in the school building. So if you have a student, a group of students, maybe an A and B group, group A, if they're in the building, are doing the synchronous lesson with you in the classroom, whereas group B will have an asynchronous lesson posted for them for that day that they're working through independently from home. And then the next day you flip. And then group B would do synchronous, group A would do asynchronous and so on and so forth. This is the model of our school. So if we look back at that schedule I showed you earlier, Tuesday and Thursday are our synchronous learning days. Monday, Wednesday, and Friday are asynchronous. So Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, I'm posting work. And um, almost always that includes videos that I've recorded, instruction, links, and it's pretty involved, uh, the, the lesson that they work through that day. But they're working through it at their own pace um, at any point in the day. And I'm available to answer questions either via email or uh, I have office hours that students come to uh, for help during that asynchronous learning. Tuesday and Thursday, if we're in the school building, they'll come to the school building. If we're completely remote, we'll meet on Google Meet. If we have two groups, some of the kids will come to the school building, some will come on Google Meet. Regardless of where students are, this is our school model and it made it really easy for us to stay consistent uh, last March when we transitioned to COVID because we kept our model exactly the same, but instead of coming to the school on Tuesday and Thursday, they just showed up on Google Meet instead. Um, I'm a big fan of asynchronous learning. I think asynchronous learning, I was gonna say necessitates, um, it's not the right word. There is a necessity for doing a lot of uh, pre-teaching of executive functioning skills in order to be successful with asynchronous learning. So students really need to understand how to set timers, how to make a plan at the beginning of the day, how to use a calendar, how to check in, how to ask questions, all of these really important executive functioning skills in order for them to be successful working asynchronously. I think a lot of us realized last spring that when we just post a piece of work for students, they're not necessarily going to just do it, right? Without teaching those skills, holding students accountable and coming up with methods that really work. Um, however, I think the benefits are tremendous because students then have those skills for life in terms of self-motivation, organization, time management. And, uh, and a lot of them really enjoy it. It's the biggest feedback I hear from students is they like being in control of their schedule. They like directing their learning on those days. In a scenario where you are doing an alternating instruction schedule with an AB group, this is how I would recommend um, scheduling. So this is kind of maybe a lot to look at right away on the screen, but let me just point you to a couple key elements here. 
the bottom of the screen, you can see a computer or a person. Those indicate whether the group is uh, asynchronous, meaning remote on the computer, or synchronous in person with you. And in this instance, each of these lessons is color coded to indicate which lesson it is. So if you just look at the group A model, you'll see that group A I've planned five lessons for, and group B is getting those same five lessons in a different order. Um, so on Monday and Tuesday, group A will be asynchronously working on a project. And typically on a Monday, I'm having them work on something ongoing or reviewing vocab, uh, working on a book project, something that doesn't need direct instruction, um, you know, or, or new material for. Whereas group B is in the classroom with me learning a new, learning new material or doing a Pear Deck or doing that practice and application like we modeled yesterday. Then the next day, they switch. Group A is getting that synchronous lesson with me in person. Group B is then going to go work on that ongoing project or doing the review. On Wednesday, all of my students are asynchronous. So they're all going to get a lesson that applies the new learning from their Monday or Tuesday lesson. And then Thursday and Friday is just a repeat of the previous. Um, the asynchronous group can apply new learning again or continue to work on ongoing projects or reviewing material. Whereas group B will get another lesson, new material, and that will flip. So still planning five lessons a week. You just have to have Monday and Tuesday's lessons planned before Monday. Then you have to have Wednesday's lesson planned by Tuesday and Thursday and Friday's lessons planned by Wednesday. Um, unfortunately, I'm still lesson planning like you know, just before I need to. Um, and that's how, that's how I do it so that I'm not planning 10 lessons a week. I'm still just planning five and the students are alternating when they'll, um, when they'll access that work. This for me um, is really helpful because it keeps it simple in terms of the technology in the room. If I'm teaching the students in the room, I don't necessarily need to consider how to coordinate it with the students at home. The students at home can be independent, they're working through it, and then hopefully during the day I'm, I'm able to jump on office hours or, or support them kind of depending on my schedule or what the students in the room are doing. The downside to this, of course, is that you have less connection with the entire group. A and B groups aren't necessarily going to see each other as much um, if you're alternating instruction, unless, of course, you build in moments for just a whole class check-in or you're asking them to do collaborative work, maybe on Wednesdays, right? They're all posting to Flipgrid together or they're all doing something on a Google Doc that they can all see each other's work and kind of connect with each other in that way. Another slide that I like to show you might have seen if you came to the, the little promo we did last week is whenever I'm asking my students to apply their learning, I like to give them some options in terms of how they apply that. So um, this is a great example because I actually did a version of this today. Students recorded podcasts uh, for their personal narratives. And then in class, I asked them to create a uh, sort of, I wanna say CD cover, but you know, like the image that you see when you're going to download a podcast, podcast image cover that uh, represents the mood, just like you see in this image of that story that they told. And I wanted them to represent mood through color and through imagery. And they have the choice, they could draw it and they could just draw it on paper and they did not have to use technology. Then they would take a picture of it and upload it. So that would be an example of using a phone or mobile device in order to submit that work. Or they could bring it in uh, in person if you're going to see them that way. Or they have the option to do it digitally. So in this case, I'm showing an example of creating on slides or creating video. My students just had the option to, to use a program called Canva graphic design program to create it digitally. Whenever possible, again, if access to technology is an issue, think about how the application could be done 
with or without technology, um, and if there is a paper-based option you could provide. And then finally, again, what could be accomplished on that mobile device? Uh, if you're using Google Classroom as your LMS, there's a great app. Uh, parents can download it onto their phone or students can download it onto their phone. It could be as simple as just making sure all the instructions for your asynchronous works are on Google Classroom that could be accessed via phone. And then there's always an option for having it done on paper if the families um, need that option from home. Reading instructions, watching in videos, obviously, uh, can be accomplished on phones quite easily, and taking pictures of work um, and adding those to the assignment as an evidence of student work. Um, the next thing, uh, we're talking about different models for hybrid learning. All of that was uh, my suggestions for alternating with synchronous or asynchronous. What I modeled last night was coordinating, correlating, or paralleling a synchronous instruction. So group A in the classroom is getting the same uh, instruction as group B who is at home. This definitely uh, is only possible if your students all have devices. They'll all need their own device in order to participate in a lesson like this. The students on site could potentially be without a device if you have a digital version for the students at home to work on and a paper version for the students on campus to work on. But there's a lot of moving parts in that case. The easiest by far way to do coordinating uh, or paralleled instruction is to have every student on a device and every student on your Google Meet or Zoom meeting, regardless of if they're in the room or at home. So you're just teaching essentially a remote lesson like you would if you were entirely remote but you have students in the room with you who you can uh, you know, provide additional supports to. Um, 